My colleague Sebastian Schneeweiss has uh, graciously agreed to kick off our conversation uh, this afternoon. Sebastian's a, uh, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, has, uh, has done, I, I think, as much as anyone in the country in the field of pharmacoepidemiology to help us uh, understand uh, when observational studies can be done well. I think uh, he's done a great job of elucidating the many ways they can be done badly that we, we should understand how to avoid. And, uh, and, and, and he's, uh, uh, he's putting uh, his, uh, his money where his mouth is and uh, developing an empirical, uh, an empirical uh, set of data around when, uh, when observational data uh, uh, are, are comparable to, uh, to randomized trials. So I think he's thought as deeply as anyone about it. And Sebastian, delighted to have you uh, start us off. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Rich, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, could you start the slides, please? Thank you. Uh, so I have three slides at the beginning just to set the stage because we just discussed that real-world data doesn't mean the same to everybody in this audience here, and I'm talking about a specific segment of real-world data in order to illustrate my points. Um, so when we think about data for effectiveness research in, in healthcare, care, uh, we have kind of the world of randomized trials over there to the left, let's say, uh, the, the non-interventional studies. And within the non-interventional studies, we have two major different sources of data. One is primary data, data that were generated for conducting research on these subjects, versus uh, transactional data. And these data are secondarily used for research. The data are generated for other purposes, right? Uh, and then you can drill even further down on, this, on the right side here. Uh, some of these data are generated for clinical documentation. That's when you're sitting across, across from a, of a physician, your primary care provider, instead of looking at you, the provider is looking at the computer screen. The writer is generating the data that we love to work with, right, uh, at this stage. Uh, electronic health records, NDI from the coroner's office in the United States, lab tests are often categorized as clinical documentation data. And then, of course, we have the world of administrative data. Uh, once uh, physicians want to get paid, they submit claims to the insurance companies. Uh, and with the claims, they're also submitting uh, information on diagnosis, on procedures. Uh, and that is also quite, quite a useful uh, resource for the type of research that I'm doing in pharmacology. Epidemiology. I would argue that in, in my field, pharmacoepidemiology, about 90% of the research is done in that realm of uh, transactional data. <clears throat> and a lot of um, pros and cons need to be considered here, and I will go uh, talk about some of them. Uh, when we talk about registry studies, you always have to ask twice, what exactly do you mean by the registry? Because it can be any of the above, really. This is how we do this. You have these transactional databases, dynamic databases. Uh, information uh, is uh, entered as time goes on. Each little blue dot, blue arrow is new information dropping into the database. These little spaghettis in the middle of the database are individuals as they enroll in a plan and disenroll in a plan, right? And we observe them for that period of time. What we usually do first is we stabilize the, the data, right? In order to be reproducible, that we then do the analysis today and tomorrow we get the same findings uh, because this is a dynamic database originally. And then we look at each of the spaghetti lines each of them being a patient, and see, you know, observe uh, all healthcare encounters that happen to these patients, hospitalizations, pharmacy dispensings, uh, diagnoses, and procedures. <clears throat> and uh, on, on those data, we then implement our, our study. Uh, here is a cohort study that we implement. Uh, so that's all fairly straightforward. Just want to make sure that we're all uh, talking the same thing. And when I'm thinking about um, um, real-world data analytics for regulatory decision-making, I have kind of three use cases in mind. One use case is uh, secondary indications, so the medications out in the marketplace, uh, but you want to broaden indication uh, with regard to a different outcome, a different population. That's certainly one indication, uh, one, one use case um, for, for this type of data analysis. And then uh, these adaptive pathways, as the uh, European Medicines Agency has that formulated or accelerated approval pathways, where you get your um, indication a bit earlier um, based on, on surrogate endpoints often um, with the understanding that you will generate um, uh, evidence on clinical endpoints as the medication is used in the marketplace for receiving a full approval. 
And of course, uh, the third use case is, is the safety space where everybody feels actually quite comfortable uh, in the regulatory space where uh, at the time of approval in the, in the Sentinel trials, uh, there were already signals generated of, of potential safety concerns. You start right away with a post-marketing commitment in order to study it deeper. Or uh, in 3B, uh, a safety signal pops up through whatever mechanism and you follow up uh, using these, these data sources. Right? So keep that in mind. So what I will do now is I will show you some examples of database studies uh, and compare them to RCTs with regard to uh, the, the, the findings. And it's a very, very biased uh, sample. First of all, they're all happy examples. And I know, I know many, many sad examples where things don't work out. So it's very, very biased. Yeah. The next bias is that I was involved one way or another in any of these examples. And the reason for that is I'm a slow reader, but also I can tell you the backstory in case you, you want to want to know, right? Also highly biased. But nevertheless, let's, let's dive in here. A protonin during uh, cabbage surgery as a, as a drug that stops bleeding. Surgeons love it. Uh, uh, we found um, a, an increased risk of, of dying uh, in those patients during hospital stays. Uh, this went up to, to regulators and um, didn't change much in the label. A few months after this was presented to the regulators, the BART trial, the Canadian trial, the a protonin arm was stopped, right, uh, for increased risk of death, and the point estimates are actually quite comparable. So this is a safety use case. Again, we feel quite comfortable in that space. Uh, um, uh, Hallett is, um, uh, this is a joint work with, with Hallett Zelzer, who just managed the, the, the previous session. Uh, the, um, uh, the question whether there's an increased risk uh, of cardiovascular events uh, in uh, tocilizumab, a, a DMART, where in the approval trials there was an increased level of, of uh, lipid, um, of cholesterol levels observed. So the logical question was, does that really translate into um, increased risk for coronary events? Uh, the uh, multi-database study didn't find any increase in risk. And um, after the study was completed, after the database study was completed, right, the RCT was unblinded, the results became available. It turns out uh, that the, the results were actually quite comparable, both concluding there is no increase in coronary uh, events. Okay? Uh, EMPA-REG, um, uh, the, the randomized trial of empagliflozin on cardiovascular endpoints, had seen this, uh, the safety signal for diabetic uh, ketoacidosis uh, tripling in risk. But look at the small numbers, one out of 2,000 and three out of 2,000 patients, right? A wide confidence limit. Uh, so this is another use case uh, where the database had actually followed the RCT. Uh, look, the point estimate is very similar, but now the confidence limits are much tighter because the sample size is much larger, now 26 out of 38,000. So that is another safety use case. Uh, rely, of course, um, uh, the, the RCT that we talked about already. Uh, there are multiple, I should say, um, uh, database studies that follow that. This is the stuff that we did here. Uh, we found, again, a very similar result with regard to, to stroke prevention. Uh, what is interesting here when you look at the kaplan mice, I tried to align them so that they can directly compare them, uh, is that the incidence rates are lower, right, in the, in the uh, real-world data analysis. And that, of course, goes back to Bob Temple that we did didn't impose any enrichment strategy while the trial most likely did, right? So that's, that's to be expected, but the point estimates are very uh, similar. Um, again, a study uh, in the oral di antidiabetic space here, canagliflozin, uh, the study that we presented at the ADA meeting uh, last year uh, before the CANVAS trial was published. Actually, they were both released on the same day, but we were, uh, un we were blinded towards the CANVAS findings. Uh, and uh, compared to the glip ones we saw a, a almost 40% relative risk reduction with regard to heart failure hospitalization. Again, an outcome that we observe quite well in these data sources. Uh, and, and of course, you're aware of what Canvas found uh, is actually very similar to what we, what we saw uh, before the RCT was, was released. So the question is, why did these database studies come to the same causal conclusion as the randomized trial? That is really the core of the question that we're asking on this panel. And how confident are we today, right, that when we start a new study today, that that study will be equally, um, um, that we have equal confidence that we get the same causal conclusion, right? That is the challenge that we have. And 
we have seen many of these studies, right, comparing observational studies versus RCTs, these, these summary studies, and I argue they're not terribly helpful. Right? Sometimes you don't see a difference, sometimes you see a difference, and one group is happy, another group is sad. It doesn't really help anybody because over, it doesn't help you as a regulator or as a, a, a company that has an asset, right, because you're only interested in one question at a time, and you want to know whether you get it right or not for that thing. It doesn't help you that on average you get the same findings, right? Why are some of these... Uh, um, uh, squares so far off from the from the vertical line, right? Uh, that that's the real question here, right? Uh, so um, so um, so so what what we learned now? They actually when we when we think about the level of confidence that we have in non-experimental database studies, right? There are two axes that we want to look at. One is are we studying beneficial effects or harmful effects? And are we studying the intended treatment effect, or are we discovering unintended effects, surprise effects, right? Um, and I would argue, and here, here are actually the examples that we have. So canagliflozin and heart failure, that we would argue that's a beneficial effect, right? Reducing heart failure is a beneficial effect. But it was not intended, right? When we started out with the studies, we, we didn't know that, right? Uh, and it seems that we do well because the channeling is not there. Physicians are not prescribing in light of knowing that they will reduce heart failure, right? They're blinded towards that, and therefore we do well in the unintended treatment effect. Uh, and we probably do worst in the intended treatment effect uh, with the bigger time stroke, um, I don't know, we got it right, but maybe very we lucky, we, we don't know today um, why, why we got it right. And of course, in the safety space, uh, again, uh, because many of these outcomes are unintended uh, and not considered by the physician when prescribing, the confounding is, is much less strong in these settings. It's, it's helpful to keep that in mind um, when, when considering confounding. Um, the examples that you saw, right, uh, there's, a, there's a spectrum, obviously, right, where uh, on one side, clearly you want to do a randomized trial, right? On the other side, you say, well, there's no need for randomization. I really try to stay in this extreme space, right? It's much easier to talk in the extremes. The gray zone in the middle is so much harder. Let's focus on the extremes and get it right there and then slowly move into the gray space as we better understand uh, uh, where, where we do well, right? So I stay in that space. Now, when I, when, I, when I speak with my students and ask them what do you love about randomized trials, and they always have the, the baseline randomization, obviously, right? But there are two other things why a decision makers love randomized trial in my observation. One is the controlled measurement, obviously, right? We talked about this a lot already this morning. But the third point is equally important, I think. It's so easy to understand a randomized trial. I mean, sweat and tears go in the design of a randomized trial. But once it's written up, it reads often very simple, right? Which is when we discuss publicly an, a database study or an RCT, I think we're all much bolder with an RCT because we understand the RCT much better than the complex analytic that goes into a database study and all the transformations that were done to the data and things like that, right? So uh, keep that in mind because I'm, I'm going, coming back to that as well. So, so the key question then is when to do database studies? When do we feel comfortable of not going through the baseline randomization? And this is not based on any empirical systematic study. This is based on my you know, 20 plus years of experience and speaking to colleagues like, like Rich and others in, in our group. Their study question dependent characteristics are that make you want to, uh, to favor uh, a database study. One is if you have an active comparator. Uh, if you have an active comparator, remember the one study, canagliflozone versus the glib ones, two active comparator, you feel much more comfortable, right? Because now you have a physician deciding you want to start you either on a canna or start you on a glib one. But clearly there was an evaluation happening and the conclusion was let's escalate treatment, right? It happens that some got this, some got that, but, but they're much more comparable than a non-user group. Non-user groups are just tricky, right? Uh, because there is usually a reason why they didn't get treated. Number two, outcome exposure measurable. Again, we spoke about that, and that's usually the kiss of death for many of these adventures, right? Because the outcome is just not observed in the data. Think about functional status, cognitive status, pain, all these important characteristics for patients, right? They're not recorded in claims data, for example. And I would argue in EHR data that they're not either, right? So, I look at the, the EHR data of my rheumatology colleagues, and what I see is, well, looks good, come back in four months. I mean, <laughs> they don't see a DAS score, a HAC score, anything like that, right? Uh, unless it's within the registry, which is different then, right? 
And you need to have some confidence that the key confounding variables, the key risk factors for the outcomes are measured uh, in, in, in your system. Well, that might be a small universe, right? So this is kind of my attempt, kind of the Venn diagram of uh, each bubble is uh, kind of the universe of, of study questions that can be validly answered with, with RCTs, they have a bubble there, with real world data analysis, you have a bubble, uh, and I tried to make them similar because I don't really know which bubble should be bigger or smaller. Uh, and then you have this middle bubble there where you have RCTs for regulatory decision making. You have the little overlap there between that small bubble and the real world data bubble. And if you can identify that group of questions that are relevant for decision makers and where we feel confident that we can answer this without randomization, and if that is only 10% of the questions, I think we have a winner, right? Because if you don't have to put patients at risk and randomize them, right, that is good for everybody. And um, the question is only can we with confidence identify those situations um, and, uh, and not make the wrong decisions up front. So once we have answered that question, which is a hard question obviously, when to go uh, by w without baseline randomization, then the question is how to do this. Uh, and there are a bunch of data dependencies, right? Um, uh, we suggest that you proceed if the outcome is observable with sufficient specificity. Uh, that you have sufficient outcome surveillance, that kind of, if things happen, that they get recorded in your system, uh, and, um, and sufficient patient similarity is reached, which is really code word for, you know, do you get a grip on your confounding um, when, when you do the analysis, right? This is data dependent, and if the data don't give what is needed for the question, then you will need to stop here, right? You need to say to yourself uh, that um, I, I, it doesn't make sense to move forward because I won't get a valid finding. And then come a, a bunch of points um, that, uh, that always hurts me a little bit because um, we can avoid a lot of known design and analytic flaws that we see over and over published in, in our community, right? Uh, we see immortal time bias, and these biases are often much bigger than confounding biases, and they're avoidable. Confounding bias is not avoidable, right? That is in the data, uh, and you have to live with that, and you have to do um, uh, 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 statistical gymnastics to, to you know, make comparison groups similar, right? Immortal time bias is avoidable. Adjusting for causal intermediates is avoidable. Reverse causation uh, is avoidable. Uh, and also dealing with time varying hazards the right way is something that we need to um, get better uh, at in a, in a routine way. Um, um, so what we, um, yeah, we, we did a study at some point where we actually tried to mimic an RCT finding uh, was in, in uh, Medicare patients, statins, and all-cause mortality. The RCT that we had in mind was, I think, PROSPER, uh, private statin randomized trial in elderly patients. And you see the boxes are getting smaller and smaller the more we restrict this. The point that I want to make is actually on the right side here. Uh, as you move from the left to the right, uh, there's increasing restriction happening, but there's no adjustment whatsoever. These are unadjusted point estimates of the risk for dying uh, within 12 months, right? And what you see is the point estimates marching up towards the point estimate expected by the RCT just by restricting more and more. And two key restrictions are moving from an all-comer cohort to a new user cohort, right? New user of A versus new user of B. Uh, and from a, uh, a, 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 um, a non-user comparator to an active comparator, again, a huge jump in a point estimate. Just drilling into the point how important it is for us to have new users and active comparators, right? And I appreciate that that's often not the question that we're studying. But if it is the question that we're studying, we feel much more confident, right, for, for, these, for these reasons. Um, going back to this investigator controlled how to um, do robustness checks, negative positive controls, check balance of unmeasured factors. Uh, and that is, um, so again, we are, I'm largely working in the claims data space, but as EHR become more and more available and linkable to claims data, uh, this provides an opportunity for a kind of routine activity. So on the left side, you see a whole bunch of claims data characteristics. These are about 100 and 120 covariates that we defined in a claims data study. Uh, then we identified 160,000 patients, type 2 diabetes, uh, more than 18 years old. And at the end, we have about, what is it, 8,000 patients, one-to-one -one propensity score matched, uh, that was lenagliptin versus pioglitazone, right? So we have an active comparator, uh, a new user study design, one-to-one -one propensity score. About 20% thereof we could link to EHR data. On the right side, you see the EHR-defined covariates that we did not have available in the claims data. The propensity score matching was entirely done on the variables on the left side. Now we can check whether by doing so, 
we also achieve balance in the variables on the right side, smoking, BMI, the duration of diabetes, HbA1c, um, and uh, renal function, LDL, right? Did we achieve that? So the, what, what we see in this example, uh, again, I show you only the happy examples today, lenagliptin, pioglitazone, you see quite nice balance here in, in those characteristics, which we have achieved by balancing on the claims data characteristics. We did not observe these, these variables, just to make this totally clear. And what you can then do, of course, go one step further and do a sensitivity analysis and make assumptions based on this residual imbalance that you observe there, uh, knowing uh, or assuming what the effect size of each of, each of these uh, six characteristics is on the study outcome, uh, you can estimate what the residual bias would be, right? So you can do that, and you can do this, actually, and that's interesting, uh, before you unblind your final analysis before you actually estimate the association between drug and outcome. For this, you don't need any outcome information, right? And that leads me to this, um, uh, what's going through my mind here, uh, a, a little pathway here. You start out on the left side. Is the setting adequate for real-world data analysis? And, you know, many times it will be no because the outcome is not observed or other, other things are happening. And then you go to the RCT. But if it is, uh, is the data quality fit for purpose, right? And many times it will say, probably not, but it is. If it is, then you go uh, and, and write your study uh, analysis plan, right? You might want to register that and deposit it. And then you do a balance check, what I just showed you, right? Uh, before actually looking at the study outcome. And you can still abort at this point. If you don't achieve balance at this point, you can still say, okay, I don't want to go forward with this, right? It doesn't make sense because I will get a biased finding. Uh, and then you move forward with the analysis and the structured reporting, right? So that's, that's what is going through my mind, my mind when, I, when I have to... Uh, uh, decide between these things. A quick um, um, use case here, tell me, Sartre, and that's the study that people are mentioning. Well, uh, Rob wrote this uh, uh, editorial on the bullseye thingy. Um, where, um, uh, this is a, a, a case study of secondary approval, or tell me, Sartre and ARB uh, had an indication in 1998 for reducing hypertension based on blood pressure measurements, uh, and they wanted to get a secondary indication in 2009 for cardiovascular risk reduction. They had done this on target randomized trial, uh, which uh, was concluded in early 2009, I think, or late 2008, uh, where they compared uh, telmisartan, the ARP, against ramipril, the ACE inhibitor, right? Uh, against the usual uh, MACE endpoints. And look, the Kaplamai is as null as it, as it gets, right? Um, so, which for a non inferiority trial, uh, that's, that's uh, good. And uh, they received a secondary uh, indication based on that. So, our question then was uh, let's be, if we go back in time and use the claims data that were available at that point in time, in early 2009 or late 2008, um, if we would redo that study, would we come to the same conclusion? Uh, and what we did was kind of the usual new user active comparator propensity score matched analysis. And you see uh, on the right side with the gray background there, after propensity score matching, the patient characteristics are, are nicely balanced uh, between the two treatment groups, exactly as you expect that, particularly with large um, uh, numbers of users. And these are the results here. Let me point out before we actually go to the core results, the myth that database studies are always bigger than randomized trials, not the case. A randomized trial on target, look, 8,500 patients in each of the treatment groups. We found way less telomersartan patients in the real world, in quote, right, uh, in, in the database that we had available, and it was a large database. Um, so um, it is not necessarily uh, uh, guaranteed that um, you have more efficiency, statistically speaking. The composite endpoint, very similar, 0.99 versus uh, 1.01. Um, and um, uh, going back to uh, what Bob Temple taught me many years ago about if you have a non inferior study and you show uh, a null finding, right, uh, there are many dials that you can turn, just adding a little bit more measurement error and exposure, more measurement error in the outcome, everything goes towards the null. Uh, so uh, we have one of these um, assay sensitivity markers in there, which is angioedema, uh, a, a known causal effect of the ACE inhibitor. And um, we could show and demonstrate that, indeed, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, telmisart and the ARP inhibitor uh, the, the, um, had a lower risk for uh, angioedema than the ACE inhibitor, as expected from the RCT. So, so you can do these things, uh, these positive or negative control endpoints. Um, just as a reminder, non-interventional database studies, uh, we do all sorts of 
study design choices and complex uh, statistical analyses in order to mimic the randomization part of the randomized trial. We have to deal with non-standardized observations, right? And we have our, our little tricks here and there. But in the end, it's a very complex study report, right? And we have to do a better job in communicating uh, these, these study reports. Um, and uh, that is the last point on how to do this, quality improvement. Uh, you want to avoid design flaws, you want to increase transparency, uh, and you want to have audit trails uh, so that really um, the, the regulator can see exactly what you did at what stage during, during the study, and things become reproducible. Uh, there are software tools that help you with that, where you know, the user is guided through screens uh, in order to um, translate the intention of the study in a, a, a executable code. Uh, uh, you have these study reports that can be quite in extensive. Uh, on the left side here is the, uh, a tabular a report of um, how a study is set up from Sentinel. It's very, very structured, very easy to read. What are the parameters that were used to set up the study? Uh, on the right side you have an uh, a, a English um, free text um, description of, of the same things. Uh, and the reason why I'm showing you that is because when you do line programming with these complex databases, uh, in our shop at the Brigham Women's Hospital, once in a while, <clears throat> when we know that studies will most likely go to the regulators, we do double programming, right? Every time we do double programming, <laughs> we get two different results. Every time, two different results. Say, say what line programming is. Line programming is a SAS code, for example, R code, right? So um, it's one, a one-off code for a specific study. You're not using macro or something. It's a one-off, exactly, thank you, Rich. That's important to clarify, right? It's one-off code. You start from scratch writing code in order to analyze a study, right? We see the same when we compare this against the FDA tool, the, the Sentinel tools, for example, that are pre-programmed macros. Again, the, we, we found that the line programming uh, did not get to the, to the same quality. And the reason is not that our programmers don't get it. They're really good. They do this for 20 years. They're really good. It's the translation between the intention of the study to a protocol and from the protocol to the code. And from the protocol to the code, there's always room for interpretation, right? And that leads to, well, you, well you, if you would write really good protocols, there would be no space for interpretation, right? <laughs> I, I give you that, right? <laughs> but uh, I see this over and over again, right, uh, that uh, we, we, we are not precise enough, right? Um, so this translation part is, is, a, is a tricky point. And then I hear, you know, this, when it comes to transparency, right, the lack of transparency of any of these macros and pre-programmed codes, uh, I argue that line programming code, you see an example of a SAS program here, that is intransparent for me at least. Uh, that's extremely hard to read for me. I cannot check whether the intention of the study was implemented the right way in this code, this spaghetti code here, right? Um, it, some people might be able to do that, but not a larger um, a group of investigators. So and that leads to a lack of reproducibility in our field, um, which, which we, we uh, described in this paper, because Shirley Wang took the, took the lead here, that uh, we started out with 100 studies that we wanted to reproduce. A whole bunch of those we couldn't even start because we had no idea what people were doing in these published papers. And sometimes that's a consequence of the limited space that people have when they publish these papers, and we did not contact the authors, right? Uh, but, uh, but once the studies were described completely, and these are the 32 studies, actually we could reproduce very nicely the findings, right? It was not exact numbers, but it was very, very close. The interpretation certainly was exactly the same. So this is a call for to more uh, transparency in our field. Uh, and this is a study that's going on in our department where we are reproducing now 250 studies uh, in, in the same spirit and identifying what are the factors that need to be recorded to uh, make studies in the database space reproducible. Uh, and ISPI and ISPO, the two professional societies in our field, came up with this consensus statement of um, what are the parameters that need to be reported. Uh, we think today, at least, that's what we call this version 1.0, because it will evolve as we learn more uh, in order to make uh, studies reproducible. Uh, we, we work together with, with David Martin and others from, from the agency uh, to identify uh, 30 RCTs uh, that had regulatory impact and see how well, we can reproduce those RCTs with database studies. And what are the reasons 
why we succeed, and more importantly, what are the reasons why we fail. I tell my children all the time, you learn only from failures. They don't want to believe it, but I think that's really what it is. We learn from failures more than we learn from, from successes here. So, uh, so that is ongoing, more, more to come as, as we move forward. So um, I think with that, I, I conclude, and I still have two and a half minutes left, so thank you very much. Thank you.